Nyo. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. E, me, me, me. Ah. It's always kind of entertaining when you teach with technology because everything always goes completely pear-shaped when you're when you're about to start. Um, I had this incredible multimedia extravaganza that you would have enjoyed. Uh, not Prezi, you'll be glad to know. I did have a Prezi. I showed it to my dad. He vomited, so it was <laughs> it was a bad scene. So when I was uh, when I was coming in this morning, I was trying to think. There's a lot of different things that I want to tell you. And I was trying to, you know, they always say, oh, start your lecture with a hook. Make it snappy. It'll be awesome that way. And I was trying to think. I have two competing stories that I, I wanted to tell you. So I said, stop. You're both right. I'll tell them both. You know, I've got little kids, and my creativity and energy is a direct function of the amount of coffee that I have drunk in relation to the lack of sleep that I've had the night before. So my kids haven't been sleeping lately. If I don't make sense, it's their fault. But those three words, some assembly required, scariest words in the English language, and I never really appreciated it until that first Christmas. Tab A into slot B. Get your 5 8 scriptly out. Where's the Allen key? And everybody has a different sized Allen key. I blame Ikea. But at the end of it, you get this playset, and it's beautiful, and it's awesome, and then your kid never plays with it the way that they're supposed to. So now we have Care Bears assaulting Cinderella's castle that's defended by Rainbow Bright Pony. And I take a lot of inspiration from that, from the way that my kids play with these toys, breaking things, putting things back together, mashing them up in different ways. It's really cool. The other story I wanted to tell you, in 2002, I got my PhD, yay, and was promptly unhirable. <laughs> the world does not need another expert in Roman stamped brick. And it's hard to be that guy in eastern Ontario. <laughs> all of my social networks, all of my material, it was all in the UK, it was in Italy, but I made the decision to come home. No work. So I had to find my own work. I had to make my own work. I had to hustle. I call this my, my years of living in the wilderness. There were no burning bushes. There was no divine revelation. But I was out there in the wilderness. I taught math in a vocational welding program for a while. And let me tell you, working with those guys did more for teaching me how to teach than any courses I ever took as an academic. Because they were great. If, if they didn't think what you were doing had value, they, they would call you on it. That's BS, sir. I'm going moose hunting. <laughs> I did that for a while. I taught distance ed at a Canadian university. I founded three different companies, a research firm, an online liberal arts college. Uh, those two things went under. Um, but the third one with my folks, uh, and this is a shameless plug, we have a cider mill, uh, buy it. But uh, that's still going. So, so this kind of entrepreneurial thing started happening. And I started having to hustle that way and reinventing myself. And I woke up one morning and discovered that I was a digital humanist. Uh, I discovered that on the morning I saw the advertisement for a digital humanities position at the history department at Carleton. <laughs> and that's cool. That's cool, because these two lines uh, in my life, this hustling, this reinvention, this making, and, and my kids on the scene uh, came together. And I can now, in retrospect, draw that line back to when I was a kid in the upper Ottawa Valley, up in God's country, beyond Shawville. Shawville? Anybody? Yay, Shawville. Uh, when my parents decided that buying a VIC-20 computer would be a really good idea for the boys, for my brothers and I. We collected all of our coins, all of our pennies, and we went to the bank in Shawville, and then this expedition to Ottawa to the Vic 20 store on Carlin. Do you remember that? No? Just me then. This isn't me, by the way. I was a lot more dapper than this. But awesome. You turn on your, 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 your Mac, you turn on your iPad, it's magic. It works just right away. You can give it to your grandma, you can give it to your kid, and they're all doing all this stuff. 
my mom phones me up for help on her computer. Why is it not doing this? But our other software, our other platforms, it's all magical. It all works. VIC-20 was not like that. It gave you this prompt, ready. Ready for what? It was pregnant with possibilities. Let's do something, guys. We'll have to read the manual. Okay. We'll read the manual. We wanted to do things like, like this. Do you remember War Game? Matthew Broderick came out 83, 84, roughly the same time. Watch that, scared the pants off me. But he was so cool. He could make the computer do anything. He could reach out, find people, play games. Turns out he was playing with NORAD and setting off World War III. But you know, these things happened. That was the power, the promise. I wanted to play global thermal nuclear war. But I settled for this instead. Occasionally, we would go down to the city, beg, borrow, never steal. Mom's boys never stole. But we'd get a copy of Computes magazine, which used to have page after page after page of the basic codes in order for you to build your own games. So Gordy, who was the eldest, got to run the machine. He got to touch it. It was sort of a high priest kind of thing going on. I got to do the liturgy. I got to read the, the code out. 10 rem print basic blah, 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 blah. I'd read all that out. And Greg would run and get snacks. And if we were lucky, at the end of all of that, we would have More often than not, there would be a fight because there would be a syntax error in line 32 and you'd go and look. And, but you'd end up with a game. So I'd like to, I'd like, if you would indulge me for a moment, let's play a game. Let's play this game. You are standing in a small cottage. There is a fishing pole here. Exits are out. Take the pole. Pole, take it. Do not know how to go fishing. Garden path. You are standing on a lush garden path. There is a rose bush here. There is a cottage here. Exits are north, south, in. Rose taken. Ouch. Mmm, <laughs> smells delicious. I do not know how to eat rose. <laughs> the beautiful thing about this kind of game, right, and, and why this kind of game attracts a lot of attention in, for instance, literacy, second language teaching, that sort of thing, is because it forces you very quickly to learn the right vocabulary and the right way of parsing it, subject, verb, object, imperative, command, what have you. It drives you nuts. Infocom, biggest game company in the world in the 1980s. They had this advertisement. It had this brain. And it was lightning bolts and, and colors and said the most powerful graphics engine in the world. Right? It was your brain. But that whole hunt the verb nonsense, that, that stiffness, that fragility, it quickly became, when graphics engines developed, these kinds of games fell by the wayside. But this kind of game, even if something is complicated and as wondrous as Bioshock, ultimately comes down to figuring out how the computer wants you to think, right? It's the cyborg consciousness. When you play any kind of video game or interact with any website or digital medium or computer or what have you, you only achieve success once you begin to think like the machine. What do games teach us? How to play the game. This is a, what they call a cyborg consciousness, right? Where the cyb part of that comes from the Greek governor, ship's captain, the controller, right? Who's doing the controlling? It's the code. And that's the first strand in what digital humanities has to offer to this kind of conference, this kind of uh, venue when we're talking about teaching and learning in higher education. 
the humanities needs the digital because it's far too important to leave all of this to the people who know how to think like machines. Does that make any sense? When we offload our memories, our collective wisdom, our collective knowledge to Wikipedia or to the web more generally, we do that at a risk that what we get back out, right, is as a result of that code, of a way that there are rhetorics in that code, there are ways of thinking that you have to learn. So you start thinking like the machine. So what I'm going to be doing today is, is pulling out, there are lots of different strands in digital humanities work. I'm going to be pulling out three different strands that I think are of significance for you know, that whole conversation we had about MOOCs earlier, about where technology and education should be going, what our universities should be looking at. So that's the first strand, the, uh, the cyborg consciousness. The second strand comes from that impulse that my brothers and I had, right? That, I, that, that desire to make something, you know? And trying to make something on the computer inevitably involves deformation. Right? Def think performance, deformance, through doing something, it, uh, it changes it all up. It can be accidental, it can be on purpose, it can be as a result of skill, or it can be as a, a result of just working with what you've got. And I was at a conference last week, um, public history, and we had a little collective daydream. What, you know, augmented reality. Everybody loves augmented reality. Hold the screen up, look, see things overlaid on it. Well, that privileges the, vi the, the visual, and my, my elbows get tired after a while, and I walk into things. Have you done Zombie Run? Do you know this? It's crazy. It's awesome. What if all of that information, speaking as a historian, all of these stories that are attached to every single place, all of that intangible stuff, what if that could make the world thick? What if, as you move through space, those places that are heavy and replete with stories, what if the weight of all that history slowed you down and stopped you from moving through it? Well, this, um, imagine, if you will, that I clicked on that link up above, and it took you to a website where the website knew where you were in the world, started pulling up all of the information from Wikipedia, and all of these voices started speaking in tandem, telling you all these stories. The thicker the world, the more the cacophony, the, the irritation. You'd have to stop, pull out your headphones, and look around you. Look at the world anew. Right? Um, it works. It just didn't work here. Um, it's always the, uh, the trouble with trying to do tech-type demos live. Nothing ever works the way you want it to. So call this a pre-alpha an imagination, a collective uh, little dream. I can't code worth a damn. Can't do it, not very good. But I can see how things might interconnect. So that kind of deformation that occurs as a lack of my ability is also an important strand. Um, these are zombies. These are Lego zombies. Lego, the classic toy, right, for, for building up anything you want out of your imagination. It is an incredible shame that Lego is now starting to, you don't just get a bucket of Legos, you get the Millennium Falcon Lego or the Pet Store Candy Shop Lego. Oh my God. Come on, Lego. But another strand in digital humanities work um, deforms our own thinking. And I like to call this practical necromancy. I am a historian, kind of, an archaeologist, kind of. And when I was working on that, that towering book of staggering genius, Sean Graham Ex Bohemus, it's like sales rank 3 billion and 2 on Amazon. 12 people have looked at it, my mom three times. You know? I had these Roman stamp bricks, right? And in Roman stamp bricks, they have the name of the the landowner, the, the brick maker, the, the estate. And I realized as I was slowly going insane working with this material that it was actually a fossilized social network. And 
suddenly everything changed. I realized I could take that fossilized social network, introduce computerized zombies onto it, and let them interact according to that pattern. And I would simulate the past. I was very excited about this. So these are Lego zombies simulating the past. And I was really excited about that. And then I realized, but actually, I haven't simulated the past. All I have done is given these zombies rules of interaction based on what I think or how I think the past has worked. So I've actually simulated a historiography. But by letting them interact and letting different things come out of that, different emergent properties, unintended consequences, I start to see the holes in my understanding, right? I start to, I have this tool now to actually step back from how I think the world works and use computation to look at a whole landscape of possibilities given that particular story. Right? So this is a third strand of deformation, or a third strand of what the digital humanities has to offer. It deforms, gives you the tools to push your thoughts, push your research in ways that you, you hadn't thought before, push your teaching. I do practical necromancy in my classrooms. We've done some augmented reality. We did this really cool museum augmented reality pop-up book. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. So just to remind you of where I've been, in, in case you're wondering where I'm going, Right? Digital humanities, and I haven't even tried to define digital humanities yet because that's a bit of a fool's errand. Uh, there's implications of the cyborg consciousness, the deformation of our materials, deformation of our thinking. And all of this ties in well with experimental archaeology. These are the guys who, who want to understand why the cut marks are the way they are on the bones. So let's go out and butcher a pig, or I'll see how good I am at spear fishing. Right? There, it's, it's making as a way of knowing. And that, if you're going to tattoo some kind of slogan for the DH on your arm, making as a way of knowing is a good way of doing it. But digital humanities isn't new. It's not a new fad. It goes back to at least the 1940s, at least as long as humanities has been a category of university administration. And the Jesuit father, Roberto Busa, who passed away two years ago, he walked up to the president of IBM and said, your advertisement says you can do anything. Well, I need to do a concordance of the work of Thomas Aquinas and his use of the word presence. <laughs> and IBM said, OK, here's some computer scientists. Knock yourself out. So he's sort of the founding saint of the digital humanities and making as a way of knowing in digital work. So there is a bit of history to, to DH. So. Let's consider what all of this story I've been telling you, what it actually means for, for university teaching, if those kinds of strands were, were a foundation. Um, and you may take all of this with an enormous grain of salt. Because I am the man who, when Larry Page and Sergey Brin were at Stanford building Google on their way to becoming a billionaire, I was writing snotty little papers at Laurier saying the World Wide Web will never be of use or of interest to academics. The web was one year old, and our prof said, hey, there's stuff about Etruscans on the web. Go onto the web, create an annotated bibliography of every site you can find. Every site you can find. And, and, and let's talk about that. Well, there was no content fil filter on Alta Vista. I went in, and I typed in Etruscans, and I got the Sex Communist Manifesto. I said, oh, you can't do a damn thing with the, with the web, so-called web. Give me the card catalog, please. All my wisdom, 21 years old. I'd like to boot that kid if I ever met him again. So take all this with a grain of salt, because clearly I have not a good track record when it comes to telling the future. That's why I'm an archaeologist. So I've done, I've done lots of different things, right? And it comes out of, um, of those years in the wilderness. It comes out of talking with my brother, who's a fantastic teacher, uh, my wife, who's a fantastic teacher. Actually, there's a lot of people in my family who've been teachers. Um, and some of the things that I've tried have been built on these ideas of recognizing 
this increasingly cyborg consciousness, deformation of our materials and of our perspectives. I'm pretty much a one-man band, but uh, I've tr always tried in my teaching to foster a kind of playfulness, uh, whether that's game-based learning, gamification, just plain screwing around, what can we do with this? And there have been some severely epic fails. Um, I built a creepy treehouse. Heard this phrase, creepy treehouse? Urban legend, strange little man down at the end of the street builds this awesome treehouse to try and lure the, the local kids in. I was teaching in a distance ed course. It was on Roman history, introduction two. And, you know, students were writing things like, I was just a glorified Scantron machine. Right? I couldn't change the, the contents, couldn't change the anything. So, so this was against the rules, but I went ahead and did it anyway. And I, they were having trouble understanding how Vespasian, they would say, Vespasian, of course Vespasian won the Civil War of AD 69 because he was later emperor. This doesn't work. So I built this scenario in Civilization IV that would, would play with these ideas of contingency and the fact that Vespasian's win wasn't foreordained. I found students who had Civ IV were willing to play it. And I said, look, between you and me, don't write an essay. Just play the game, contrast the history that happens in the game with real history, and we'll call that we'll call that a day. And they all said, okay, sure. Not a single student would do it. They ultimately said, you know, if it's all the same, we'll just write the proper essay. Okay. It was a fail. And it failed because I'd forgotten the game of being a student. Right? You don't mess with the game of being a student. Our best students are best, not because necessarily they know the content or have deep, profound insight, but because they're really good at playing the game that we've set up. Essay, midterm, final, rinse, repeat. Screw with that at your peril, right? So our chair says the only thing worse than writing an eight-page paper is asking students not to write an eight-page paper. And you feel it on the, the final exam, or on the final evaluation. I tried this again last term with an interactive fiction that explored moving through Roman social space. And again, the, I, I lost a third of the class the week that I assigned this. And it wasn't until I said, okay, everybody calm down, take a deep breath, let's do this together as a group, that it became safe, right? There's safety in herds. I've had the occasional win, but, you know, like happy families. No, how does that saying go? What is it? War and Peace guy? No, Russian literature. I'm an archaeologist. <laughs> Tolstoy, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the wins are never as interesting as much as the failures, right? You know, imagine if we had a system that short-circuited the game of being a student, that let you try things out, let you do things differently, let you build things up, let you do it in a community safety and herds, build from zero, you know, I'm sick to death of reading essays. And it's not because essays aren't necessarily useful, it's because they're written for an audience of one. And I never get to share the really good stuff that students do. So, you know, and a lot of this is sort of a preaching to the choir moment, sort of a Coles to Newcastle, kind of a visual pun there. It's not overly funny, but if you laughed right now, it'd make me feel much better about myself. <laughs> you know, but again, in the back of your mind, there's a little voice, and somebody's probably tweeted it already. Get to the point, Graham. What does all of this imply? Well, things are starting to look a little better, but I want to address this sort of moment where DH will save us, right? There's been a lot of hires in digital humanities lately. It's sort of a sprinkle DH fairy dust, and everything will will be better, the humanities will be relevant, uh, parents will send their kids to history departments, um, they will have real skills that we can, can point to at the end of it, they'll know how to code, it will, it will save everything. And of course that kind of <laughs> story leads to a backlash. And you know you've arrived when you get a meme, right? You know your discipline's there. And at the MLA, 2013, this year, there was this 
session on the dark side of DH. And I'll hear that. Dun, 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 dun. Luke, I am your father. I know. It's better than my Golden Girls references, which my students just look at me completely blank. Picture it, Chicago, 2013. And one of the, one of the people who was there, um, she wrote, you know, the alleged promise of digital humanities is its, its dark side. Uh, it promises to save humanities by making them and their graduates relevant, by giving tech skills, allowing them to thrive in a difficult job market. Um, it allows the corporatization of the university. It's quantification and MOOCs. This session explicitly connected the digital humanities to MOOCs as an enabler. If you let somebody in your department to do digital humanities, you'll be MOOCed before you know it. And that was astonishing because the, I don't recognize that. That's not what digital humanities is to me. Those three strands that I've been trying to, to suggest don't really jive very well with, with MOOCs as we've heard them this morning. Um, <laughs> the Simpsons is always a great well for, for illustrations. And if you Google Simpsons MOOCs, you get these two characters, sort of an East Coast, West Coast kind of thing. But, you know, as, as the big MOOCs, the corporate MOOCs, the X MOOCs are currently designed, they seem to me to be a challenge to publishers of textbooks rather than, than to teaching, perhaps. There is a connection, though, between the digital humanities, and it's with the, with the C MOOC, yay, Canadian MOOCs, the, the personal learning environments, that sort of creative making kind of thing. Now I have a rainbow castle. So following my three strands and, and seeing an affinity with CMOOCs, you know, and thinking about cyborg consciousness, we, we need to really be thinking about how the, the institutional processes themselves, right? That's our code. That's our operating procedure. That's the CPU. Those things send out really strong signals about what is to be valued and how to respond. The game of being a student would not exist without our institutional structures that make that possible. So cyborg consciousness would engage with that. We would deform what we teach and we'd set up our institutions and our teaching to deform the way our students think too. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. It always makes me feel better. So what would I do? Well, I'd turn the university inside out. You know, it's been about silos for so long, ivory towers. You know what goes into a silo? I grew up on a farm. Silos are for silage, cow food. You take it out, it's all chopped up, it's kind of fermented, a little bit funky, and it becomes cud. You know, let's not do that. You know, for all of their massiveness, MOOCs and universities are massive. They're still walled gardens. And the unit of connection, it's the course, it's the container. Right? All of this that we've been talking about is still all about the container. I used to work with a guy who often said, once we get the contract, once we get the container, we'll just get monkeys to do all the work. That guy's no longer in business. I used to work for a for-profit university in the States that had a similar approach to hiring online faculty. Doesn't matter who the person is, just get them in. It's all about the course. It's all about the container. That's what they're selling. And MOOCs are not disruptive in that sense. If you want to be really disruptive, Let's turn to a model that massively connects people together with a shared interest. You know, a match.com of the mind. I, I, you know, I wasn't aware of Degree Compass until this morning, um, but it's still focused on the container. I want to go deeper. I want to, you know, seriously, think about it as an online dating. Think of university as an online dating system for faculty and students. Is that too crazy? I don't know. They're both looking for the same thing, right? In an online dating site, the, the, the men pay to be on the site. The women are rude to the site by all sorts of free promos. There's no point having a dating site that doesn't have any available others on it. So if that kind of metaphor is what we were going with, the university would be in the business of bringing together students, men, with the faculty and women, right? You'd want to 
Am I, am, is this a dead horse? <laughs> okay, thank you. The students wouldn't be signing up for classes, right? They'd be signing up to follow and work with a particular prof. It's where you'd need a reputation system. You don't buy from the person with the bad rep on eBay. You do contact the person whose profile is, uh, looks really good. We've got all of this data, right? We've got, we've got grades of students and teaching of values, faculty interests, reputations. We've got the technology. Put students and professors together in a dynamic way. Do it at the individual level. Forget about the course. Have pop-up courses, seminars. Get rid of the credit hour. Work with me for the next three weeks. And then if you enjoy Roman Civ with, with me, let me introduce you to my, uh, to my colleague who does Bronze Age G and stuff. You know, let, let students and, and, and profs have tokens. This is my first choice prof. This is my first choice student. This is my second choice. This is my third choice. Facilitate the matching of students to faculty. Let the student craft their way through the university, building their own learning, following individuals. Build a masterpiece for that final demonstration of making as a way of knowing. Okay, that might be, that might be cloud cookie land, but, and there could be better models out there, better metaphors, but the metaphor that we use, everything else flows from it. If we talk about clients and customers, that's going to mean something very different than if we talk about focusing on the relationship. Whatever metaphor we use to frame what the university does, you know, we have to think through those implications from a, a point of view of a cyborg consciousness. And once we've done that, let's have some real openness. Let's give everybody a domain of their own. Let the world see that faculty-student-student-student -student -student relationship development. Invite the rest of the world in. Give every student at the time of their registration a domain of their own, like what Mary Washington University is starting to do for their entire time at the university. Pay for it, support it. When the student graduates, let them take it over. Get that alumni network building up. Let the learning community continue after the formal assessment ends. Reconfigure your networks depending on who you're working with. The robots that construct our knowledge from the World Wide Web, Google and so on, depend on strong signals on a creative class. If each and every student at your institution is using a domain of their own as a repository for their own intellectual property, for their own personal learning, a node in a frequently reconfiguring network of learners, the gravity that your institution would create on the internet becomes the well out of which the wider world would be drawing its knowledge. Use the structure and logic of the web to embed the learning life of the university so deeply into the wider world that it can't be extricated because that's not what's going on right now, right? This is the, the Roman archaeology mental space on the World Wide Web. It took a couple days to pull this one together. It's kind of underwhelming. But if you look at it, academia does not create strong signals on the on the internet, for God's sakes, update your department profile more than once a year. Blog, it's just a platform, it's not a genre. Because people, the people are over there, and it's blogs and Twitter that connect it all together. We aren't, we are doing a piss poor job of embedding what we do where people learn about the world today, right? It's very hard to demonize or to characterize something as an ivory tower if it's right there in your face, right? Academic shouldn't be a synonym for futile or useless, but it's become that. The way the internet works right now, we can reverse that because we're dealing with robots. We can game the system. We got to start doing that. If we embed our teaching through the personal learning environments of our students, if we embed our research in those personal learning environments of our students, you know, the embedded university, the university inside out, infects society at every level. Right? Forget this massively open nonsense. It's not massively open. It's like Hotel California. You come in, you never can get out. 
Go for massively embedded. Go for massively accessible. Go for massively everywhere. It's hard to find a good image that went with that idea, so I settled for a boulder in the field because it's there. Sorry, I was going for a joke there and it kind of fell flat because the caffeine is leaving my system. It hits all these buttons, right? Leaves out that question, that, that murky question of what's tuition for? And that's where the metaphor really becomes important, right? Because if it's all about customers and clients, then tuition is about buying the, the, the degree at the end. But if it's about relationships, it's about, it becomes about, to use a hockey metaphor, it becomes about ice time. It becomes about the right to skate. It becomes about getting my undivided attention as a professional thinker. Right? It doesn't mean you're going to win the Stanley Cup. Of course, Ottawa will. But it becomes about the right to skate, the right to have a relationship. You know, and we need to have more opportunities for sideways access to that attention too, for people who have benefited from participating in our openness, in our embeddedness. Ethan Wattrell is an anthro anthropology prof at Michigan State University. Every class he does has its own blog website. All the readings are there, all of the assessment is there, all of the work the students does is publicly accessible. And the world comes to those sites and they engage with the students. They do the readings, they talk, it all comes together. Well, let's have sideways access points for those people to, to demonstrate their, what they've learned. You know, uh, George mentioned uh, the UW model. Western Governors University does interesting things too in terms of, uh, of that. And, and those are challenges for the future, I think. The digital humanities, you know, it, it was a great day that day that I woke up and discovered I was a digital humanist. Um, because I realized that a lot of the things that I'd already been doing now had a label. And I now had a platform to, to speak on from. I didn't want to be a digital humanist. I didn't set out to be a digital humanist. I wanted to be an archeologist. But the multiple ways in which archeological knowledge is constructed, its pan-disciplinary need to draw from different wells, pushed me into DH. There are many different strands to the digital humanities work. And I've only really harped on three that I think are important for, for, for this question. But I think these are the ones that could become the framework, the weave and the weft for something truly disruptive. You know, I was going to say something inspirational, connecting Stonehenge back to those instruction manuals right at the very beginning of the first slide, but I got nothing. So why don't we call it a day right there? And thank you for your attention. That's a good question. So what, what are the first steps to getting that relationship going? Um, we have a lot of deprogramming to do, right? There's a lot of students have a lot of years of working in this current system and learning how to play that particular game. And changing that over, that's hard. There's going to be a lot of resistance. Some of my officially best history students will find reasons to be sick on the days that I want to try something different, something new. There's sort of a passive aggressive resistance to it. So the first thing that I think we can be doing, you know those course evaluations? I hate them. Absolutely hate them. At least here, it's all about the prof. Did you turn up on time? No? Did you, um, do you have a clear and tinkly speaking voice? There's nothing in there about what the students have done. What have the students brought to the table? And in little ways, we can start 
changing the conversation so that students remember too that they've got responsibility and that it's not a one-way relationship, that it's a two-way. Did you come to every class? What did you expect to get on this? What have you done to, to, uh, to make this a good environment? And in little ways like that, I think, you start to put up these little signposts, these little markers that change the, uh, start to change the conversation. Little reminders that you know, it's not all about this guy up at the front who's doing the dog and pony show. I get terrified in front of every class. I have to put on the mask and go into showman show. And I tell students, you know, like there's, there's 50 of you and you're all staring at me with the undergrad stare. You know, you're all, you're all trying to show me that you don't care about what it is I'm talking about. That I'm dead to you. Because you don't want the person next to you to think that you're interested and invested. So there's a lot of that sociology that has to, to, to be dealt with. The, the one plug-in that George showed, the SNAP, the social network analysis for, for Moodle, if we're looking, that kind of thing can be really powerful. We did that at the high school where I was teaching at. We actually went around to all of the home rooms and we asked each student, who's the, who's the student at school that you most look up to, who, whose opinion you value most, who influences how you behave? You don't have to be friends with them. Nobody's going to see this. And we did the whole thing and we worked it all out and the person who had the highest between this centrality, okay, so this network metric that measures all of the possible paths of influence in a network, the person who sits right in the middle of all that is this kid who was just a right jerk. I mean, I loved him. He was one of my students. But, but he really was a mean kid sometimes and he sat there right in the middle. So it's not, you know, Contra what George was saying about the social networks, finding these people who aren't participating in the conversation. It's more important to find those ones who, who join disparate parts of the network together or who sit at the exact middle and, and working with them. You know, trying to, to target those people first. One of the first things I did at Carleton when I arrived, because I had no idea of the landscape here. Um, I was in a history department. Canadian history department, Roman archaeologist, Canadian historian, worlds do not meet. So I started mapping out from emails, from project websites, from the university website, who is doing what in digital humanities work to try and figure out just this kind of thing. Who do I need to talk to? What's going on? And actually, it was really amazing because the, the librarian archivist is the pivot point for the entire digital humanities scene at, uh, at Carleton. It, the, the whole map kind of looks like Italy. She's uh, general. It's, it's, it's quite cool. And if we start doing that, and that's kind of what I'm talking about when the university's inside out, too. You've got all these metrics. Uh, George called it granul granularization. Well, figuring out the social aspect of who's doing what. Frig, if a MOOC did that for crying out loud, they would change their uh, dropout rates instantly. Copyright Sean Gray. I see, I see what you're saying. The argue, is it, is it, can, we, can we affect any sort of change at the, at the stage where we get the students versus this entire system that's fostered a particular way of, a particular
particular game? Yes and no, I think, because they're very good at playing the game. They understand games. We all understand games. We all respond to the same things too, right? I go out for tenure in September. That's a game as much as anything else. Having the skill to play the game, I think if you show them the game it is that they're playing and suggest that there's a different game, a better game, then you can get the buy-in. Like I, I occasionally teach a first-year seminar course, and those students tend to stick with me. Uh, I mean, yes, I've only been here for four years, so the first batch is, has come with me all the, all the way through. And, and those first year students, second year students, most of my teaching is at first and second year. Those students you can reach. You can show them the game. You can say, look, there's a different way of doing this. And if you take courses with me, this is the game that we'll be playing. Be aware of the game in other courses because what you do in my class might not fly in somebody else's class. Be aware of the, the rules that, that you're in. The problem I have are with senior students who've never encountered me before who come back and take a second year course with me thinking it's going to be a cakewalk, and I've completely changed the rules again. And, and then, you know, and then all hell breaks loose. But, but if we, you know, we focus on those first and second year students, and you just normalize it, then you, you switch from one kind of normal to another kind of normal without anybody noticing the transition. That's my recipe. That's it. That's it. It's, it's getting buy-in from other folks who've been invested in a very different system. And so, like, my, in digital humanities work, there's, there's open peer review, there's these digital things, there's all these different models, and people view that as a, as a threat to the existing system. And it's not a threat, it's just, look, there's another game we can play too. It'll be fun. Again, for this very insightful, engaging uh, talk.